Is it the right metric to look at? And if not, why? Sure. It is an important metric. While I agree with your, your economists, it certainly doesn't represent all of consumer spending, but it is the goods part of consumer spending, which is the most cyclical indicator. Mm -hmm. So it is actually an early indicator of how healthy the consumer is doing. So something that you wind up looking at, which I find very interesting, is housing and how housing and renting versus owning is actually reflective of a changing consumer base that does have very uh, big implications. Yes, it does. What we focus on in this report that you're mentioning is a, essentially a dismantling of the American dream, 35% of U.S. households now rent instead of own. Mm -hmm. And the reason that's really important is, is home ownership has been the engine of growth of the United States. So if you think about investing in new businesses, a store of security, if there's a job loss or health care needs, that's what, what consumers have drawn upon. And now we no longer have that. And then the reason why it's significant is this chart here, which is basically when your rent is higher than inflation and higher than wages, it just means you may have less money to spend now and in a downturn in particularly. That's absolutely right. So we're very concerned about the fact that this significant portion of the society who is now renting is facing much higher costs. So mm -hmm. rental costs are growing much faster than wages, which, which creates vulnerabilities in a downturn. So for you then, New York KKR, so I obviously do. like you do the report because you want to actually be able to provide some analytics to make money. What's the offset of this? Sure. The offset is there are tremendous opportunities in multifamily housing and affordable housing and single family family rentals mm -hmm. and across our firm in real estate, in private credit, uh, in a number of areas, we are invested behind this theme. Uh, what about the uh, implication for the consumer? So the read through from the consumer, if they're changing, if they don't have as much money as we think, or particularly in a downturn, how are they spending differently? How do you capitalize on that? Sure. Well, one, from the consumer perspective, what we're worried about is consumers no longer have any savings, right? So if you mm -hmm. are renting literally on a regular basis, your savings is zero, which means you can't afford to buy a home. Um, what that does mean is this transition in consumer spending behavior where they're not only renting their homes, um, but they're also renting clothing. They're renting cars or using ride sharing apps more and more. So it's a complete transition in the type of consumer and the profile of consumer we're used to. Yeah. And you broke down sort of uh, the Airbnbs of this world versus clothing versus ride sharing and, and I have three charts that we wanted to kind of go through and one uh, is uh, the ride sharing issue so if you take a look at the growth and say taxi cabs and ride sharing versus nope we're going to this one okay the sharing economy in terms of the Airbnb versus hotel the difference yes. and it's huge it's in massive. major cities meaning it's that like massive. if you're a regular if you're anybody you might want to go and do Airbnb versus uh, renting a hotel which means that it's kind of business model is sustainable Absolutely. And this is one of the major drivers of sharing economy models. Mm -hmm. It is often cheaper. Right. So if you're looking to if you're going to a new city and need a hotel, it's actually cheaper to rent a, an Airbnb. So it makes sense. And I agree. These are sustainable models. So they are new business models, right? Yes. Uh, are there opportunities, uh, low hanging fruit? Like you're not going to want to invest in Airbnb now when it's about right. to go public. Right. So right. are there uh, more low hanging fruit for smaller companies to get involved? Well, the way we think about now and where, you know, we talked about where valuations are, certainly we're probably at peak valuations more generally, mm -hmm. but we are long-term investors at KKR. So we're not just looking at where valuations are today, but where are their demand drivers that will sustain growth over the long term? So what about the clothing industry? Um, what, how has this been disrupted and what's the implication for that on an investor level? Sure. So when you think of companies like Rent the Runway, Poshmark, or Tulare, which has a really interesting model, they've come of age in an environment where we're seeing in the chart you put up um, clothing utilization has declined significantly. We are in an environment where the Instagram culture, where you're photographing everything you wear, and so you can't get caught wearing it twice, right? So what that means is that consumers are trading in and out of their clothing all the time, mm -hmm. and that becomes quite expensive. These models allow you to keep your costs low while still being able to go through your go through a closet uh, pretty quickly. So when you're giving advice to then the, the, the portfolio managers at KKR etc and, and the managers what do you say? Sustainable? Uh, where's the opportunity, et cetera? Sure. So we, we look, give advice on two ends. One, there are these models are disruptive. So if you're investing in a traditional player, be very careful if any, you know, if it's true that the cost of owning an asset is very high, that consumers actually don't want to hold on to an asset and maintain it for a very long period of time. So high value, low usage mm -hmm. um, type of products, mm -hmm. that area is likely to be disrupted. On the other hand, from an opportunity perspective, if a, a sharing economy 
economy platform can help make access to a product or good more convenient or accessible, and the costs are very low. And more even, more, moreover, if there is an impact angle um, to a given product or service, that's an area you should lean into and lean into a sharing, sharing economy model. We want to wrap it up talking about uh, women of Wall Street, which is basically hearing from the key women in finance that are making the big decisions today. And so I wanted to get your take on if you're building a team, how do you hire? What do you do to build the best team you can right now at KKR? Very good question, and thank you for that. Building diverse teams, I think, guarantees uh, are, are important for superior outcome generation. It's often easier to, you know, manage, run a team where everyone around a circle is thinks just like you. But the reality is, particularly in the environment we're in right now, where you're seeing disruption from so many different angles, the environment is so dynamic, it behooves you to have people who think differently from you so that you can anticipate and manage the left and, and right side tailwinds. How do you do that? Do you have to go to industries, untraditional? traditional uh, education, or example, or people with different and diverse uh, resumes. How do you do it? You do that a number of angles. I don't think there's one mm -hmm. uh, single bullet. Um, look at different types of colleges or business schools. You um, certainly activate your network. But it's really about diversifying the funnel such that at the end, you're still getting the highest uh, potential talent, but you're getting them from a diverse set of sources.